choice about when I came into this world. I didn't make any decisions regarding it, didn't even know about it until, until I, I got, got here. here. And didn't even know about that for a couple of years. Anyway, um, I had nothing to do with that. But I am glad that I'm alive today for several reasons. I'll tell you why. We, we've never had the Bible like we have today. Never had access to the Word of God like we have today. The Bible's God's Word. You read it and you study it and it'll change your life. It's a powerful book. And mankind has never had access to the Word of God like we have today. Can you imagine, as was done in, in the past in history, trying to stamp out the Word of God? Can you imagine if in America they made it illegal to possess the Word of God how that could be gone about. In other words, to eradicate the Scripture from the world. Was it Voltaire that said in what a matter of, uh, was it two, 200, 200 years? 100 years. Of 100 years that the Bible would no longer exist? Can you imagine today trying to eradicate this book? Okay, you can't have a hard copy of the Bible. How many of y'all have the Bible on MP3? How many of y'all have, I mean just, how many of y'all have more than one Bible in your home? The Scripture is spread throughout the world. And the Bible is what's powerful. It's not man's wisdom, man's words. It's the Scripture that changes lives. You get in this book and you read it, and it'll change your life. That's what will happen. It's a powerful book. And we have better access than ever before. I'll tell you something else that's great about the time in which we live. Christ's coming is nearer than it's ever been before. The coming of Jesus Christ is nearer than it's ever been before. You know, the early Christians looked for the coming of Christ. And some of them were even confused about it and wondering, how come people have died that believed in Jesus? How come some folks are asleep, as the Scripture would call it, and we thought Christ was going to return and take us into heaven? And Jesus over and over again assured His disciples, He said, It's not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath placed in His power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And he promises us, you don't know when my physical earthly kingdom is going to be, but you do know this, you can have my power now. And that's been a promise to believers since the early church. Not only that, and so that's a great reason to be alive. We can be empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. And God can speak to us individually. That's, that is unprecedented to be able to have the power of God in our lives. And that's for every believer in Jesus Christ. It's a promise of God. It's a great reason to be alive. And I'll just tell you one last thing, one last reason that I'm glad to be alive today, and that's this. We're living and we have breath. And that means a whole lot. The fact that you are living and that you are ha that you have breath, if you'll study the Bible, you'll find that God is concerned about every individual soul. And God's got a plan for every person's life. And if you're living and you have breath, it means God's got something for you. And God doesn't tell us to go out and preach the gospel to every creature so that they'll reject it. God is preparing hearts to receive the message of the gospel and is preparing us to preach it. And the reason he's doing that is because folks are going to be saved. And we have great hope. We have great hope. Folks, be what God wants you to be and preach the Word of God. And you know what you'll find out? Folks will trust Christ. I've met folks this last week that have just come to the Lord and God is in the process of changing their lives. And folks, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have people have new life and be growing spiritually. So be encouraged. Well, Ezra is one of the most encouraging books in the Old Testament, I believe. We're going to read our text this morning, which is going to be chapter 1. We're going to pray. And I just want to make a couple points by way of application now to kind of start us as we study through this book. By the way, look at chapter 2 real quickly. Anybody see what that is? We're going to read all that today just for fun. Okay, Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1. The Scripture says this, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, and with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, beside the freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests, and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised, to go up to build the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with the vessels of silver, with gold, with goods and with beasts, 
and with precious things, beside all that was willingly offered. Also Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth out of Jerusalem, and had put them in the house of his gods. Small g. Verse 8, Even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Mithridath, the treasurer, and numbered them unto Shishbazar, the prince of Judah. And this is the number of them, thirty chargers of gold, a thousand chargers of silver, nine and twenty knives, thirty basins of gold, silver basins of a second sort, four hundred and ten, and other vessels a thousand. All the vessels of gold and silver were five thousand and four hundred. All these did Sheshbazar bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. Now let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's ask for His help as we go to the Scriptures this morning. Heavenly Father, we believe that this morning we are in the place that You want us to be. God, I don't believe that there's anyone in this room that You don't want to be here this morning. And Lord, because You want us to be here, we believe also that You want to speak to our hearts. Lord, this morning we're asking that You would do just that. That from Your Word being made alive, You would speak to our hearts and our lives and show us, according to the Scriptures, the kind of heart's attitude that we need to, be, to have in order to please Jesus Christ. Make clear the Scripture. Lord, I ask that You would use me as the instrument this morning, that You would empower me with Your Spirit, and that, Father, that You would help us to see ourselves in the light of Your Word so that we could be changed to be more like Jesus. And we pray in His precious name. Amen. Well, here's the scenario. Here we have a king, Cyrus, who was the king of Persia. Now, somebody tell me, uh, geographically, where was Persia located? Iran. Iraq. It was where? Iran. Iran. Very close to Iraq. But it was in Iran. So this would be in the Middle <coughs> East. And um, what kind of position did Cyrus have? King of we know he's a king. The Persian Empire. Okay, the Persian Empire. Was there a bigger empire in the world than the Persian Empire? More two, but not much. Not much. Persia would have been one of the greatest, wealthiest, most successful empires in the world. And Israel would have been carried captive. The children of Israel would have been part of the kingdom of Persia. How would they have been part of the kingdom of Persia? Well, because of the captivity under Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And so this is a mighty, mighty kingdom and a mighty, mighty king. And I want to point out something to you this morning that I think is one of the most encouraging things in the book of Ezra. One of the things that I believe is most encouraging about this book of Ezra is the person upon whom God laid it on His heart to rebuild Jerusalem. You know, folks, many times we look at society and we look at how things are, and as we look at how things are, we say things are bad. Things aren't how they should be. And we recognize that. <coughs> And if you're a part of the nation of Israel, you're one of the children of Israel, you could have looked at Jerusalem and seen nothing but disrepair. You could have looked at the people that Israel represented and you could have seen, seen people that were not concerned about God and they were not concerned about the things of God. Matter of fact, the children of Israel were happily sojourning. To sojourn means to dwell or to live in a place that is not your home. That's what believers are doing. When you're saved in Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Listen, folks, we're not looking forward to the day in which eternal life happens to us and we live forever. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, the moment you ask Jesus to be your Savior, your eternal life begins. In other words, you no longer are the enemy of God. You no longer are separated from God by your sin, but you have new life in Christ and you'll never die. I'm not afraid of physical death because physical death is only separation of my soul from my body and that is only temporary. Folks, but I'm not, all, I'm not looking forward to physical death because I've already got eternal life. Well, I know some Christians, boy, I mean, it's like they've just quit already. It's like, well, I'm saved, you know, and things are bad, but when I die, things will be better. You know, I'll be in heaven and I won't be in a sin-cursed body and I won't be surrounded by a bunch of wicked people and things will be pretty good. Christian, when you're saved, the Bible says that you have new life in Christ. That means you're alive, you're living. In the same way, you're going to be alive in heaven. And not only that, but the Bible promises that we are equipped with the things that pertain to life and godliness. We already have the great and precious promises whereby we're partakers of the divine nature. So not only do we have access to God. Folks, it is a wonderful thing to have access to God in heaven. Listen, I don't know how many of you folks are here uh, that would like to meet certain people. There are certain folks that I would like to meet. I would consider it an honor to meet. 